Hi there, my name is Nate. I run Jesus People SF. Today I would like to discuss God's position on big government. God's position on big government. Now, um, the reason I want to talk about this is because the state of government, especially in the United States, has gotten so flippin' large uh, in the past uh, 100 years, not to mention 50 years. It is a monster. It uh, spends more uh, more than it takes in in revenue. And um, the state of government is basically to eat up all the increase of its people. And this is the case for many, if not most, Western nations, where the government spend far more than even uh, can be made up with the gross domestic product of the people. And even if governments were to tax at 100% of people's income, they would not be able to recoup the amount that they are spending each year. And governments seem content with this. And I want to talk today because, not just of that, but because Given that government has become so massive, whether it is a conservative uh, administration uh, or a liberal administration, the, the size of government just seems to increase. The spending increases. No one seems super concerned of the untenable situation with government. Um, what is God's position on big government? And it's actually not silence and it's not neutrality. But first, let me just uh, show you some of the problems that have issued forth from big government. So um, here is a report from a lady named Cheryl Atkinson, or she's talking about a report of the U.S. Uh, Representatives Committee on Small Business. And um, there was a State Department funded censorship uh, for free speech. Here's another one. I'm sure uh, you've heard of this one. Um, in the UK, um, authorities will not only uh, arrest you for a right-leaning post, uh, a, a, you know, just a social media free speech type post, but they're wanting to extradite U.S. citizens, including Elon Musk, for their posts, which they simply disagree with uh, uh, from a political perspective. You really can't put it any other way. Now, you can you can uh, spin it a certain way and say this promotes violence, but speech is not violence. And um, here we have just some talk about the censorship that is occurring in Canada, um, the U.S., and different things like that. But just just look at the look at the title of this. The censors are in charge now. Um, and, you know, here we have in uh, a text of First Samuel, and just to give a little background, this is sort of the in-between stage between the season of the judges in Israel's history. Um, after Moses and Joshua, there were rulers called judges. They did not yet have a king. And each tribe or set of tribes kind of had a judge raised up by the Lord. And the idea behind this was God raises up sort of like a strong leader as they're needed, not as some kind of, you know, dynasty or automatic thing like a monarch would have. Um, and so the problem is that at the end of the season of the judges, um, Samuel, who is both a prophet and a judge, so someone who rules and decides on cases and kind of leads the people, and um, is a prophet as well, directly hears from God, and is one of the most spectacular of the prophets, um, Samuel decides uh, to set up his sons as judges, and they're not very good. And the solution in the eyes of the people is to demand a king. Here's where we pick up in 1 Samuel 8, verse 1. And it came to pass, when Samuel was old, he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, the name of his second, Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre, and took bribes and perverted judgment. 
Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him. Now notice what they don't say. They don't say, Samuel, you're doing us wrong here. You can't set up your own sons as judges when, first of all, the Lord didn't do that, number one. Number two, they're not faithful judges. That could have been a perfectly just complaint to bring to Samuel. But what's the complaint they actually bring? Um, the, then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Now tell me, just as far as the thesis of a monarch versus a judge, what protects the people from having a bad king versus a bad judge? I don't really see the improvement there, but the people tell them, tell Samuel the reason why they want a judge. It's not because they want a better ruler. It's because they want a king to judge us like all the nations. They want to be like the nations. It is sort of a lust to be something other than God set up, something different than what God intended. And it says, the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to Yahweh. And Yahweh said unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should reign, not reign over them. So part of the deal with the judges is the judges are sort of vicars. They're sort of like in-betweens between God and the people, but God is the king. And when they demand a human king, they are kicking God off the throne. That's really what happens here. According to all the works they have done against me since the day I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, even unto this day wherein they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they do unto thee. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. So God in his mercy kind of set up Israel in a way that's similar to the United States in its early days. What was the set up with the power of the of of the US in those early days it was states power it would it was the power of individual states to enact most of the laws and decrees of the country another way of saying this is instead of majority rule as in a pure democracy it was um sort of divided up into little uh, regional uh sections so that it would be a regional power deciding regional concerns, which I think is superior. And that's exactly how God had it set up with the tribes, each judging their own situation. The judges were not over all of Israel, with maybe the exception of Samuel alone. It was regional judges over different sections of Israel as the need arose. And so as uh, the people are demanding this, God wants them to know the cost of big government. And he makes it very plain and simple, which is utterly applicable to our own day. And if your position when it comes to government is one where, why isn't the government doing more? Believe me, you have the utterly wrong mentality. The more government you have, even to oversee bad stuff, eventually that power is going to be abused. They will never return that power to you. They will misuse the power at some point, and that power will continuously increase like a hungry animal that gets fatter and bigger and harder to control. And so God says to Samuel, I want you to tell the people exactly what's going to happen with a king, a centralized government. And Samuel told all the words of Yahweh unto the people that asked of him a king, and he said, this will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. Now, I've highlighted a particular phrase. Take notice of what phrase I've highlighted here. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen, and some shall run before his chariots. And he will appoint captains over thousands, captains over fifties. He will set them to ear his ground to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and instruments of, by the way, who's the, who's the center right here? His chariots, his instruments of war, his ground, his harvest. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries or, you know, basically like bakers of sweets and stuff 
to be confectioners and to be cooks and to be bakers. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards and even the best of them and give them to his servants. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and his servants. Notice the language here. It's not the people. It doesn't belong to the people. It belongs to the king. And it's all about him at this point. And he will take your manservants and maidservants and your goodliest young men and your donkeys and put them to work. And he will take the tenth of your sheep and you shall be his servants. Do you hear that? You shall be his servants. He doesn't serve you. You serve him. And you shall cry out in that day because of your king, which you have chosen or which ye shall have chosen you, and Yahweh will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, Nay, we will, but we will have a king over us, that we may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard the words of the people, and he rehearsed them in the ears of Yahweh, and Yahweh said unto Samuel, Hearken unto their voice, and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, Go ye, every man unto his city. You know, sometimes when we demand our way from God, he says no. Sometimes, an even scarier time, he says yes, but it's not a mercy. It's not like a, yes, there, there, this will be wonderful sort of thing. As God points out, just look at the language he uses over and over again. He will take. He will take, he will take, he will take, he will take. You shall cry out. Uh, And and the emphasis there of what the king is doing for himself, basically, um, he will take um, and give them unto his servants. Um, He will take your vineyards and uh, um, give to his officers and his servants. He will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. You see the emphasis? In a big centralized government, it serves itself. It does not serve you. Now do you see why the founders of the United States were so concerned to make sure that the power of the centralized government was weak? When the United States was set up, it had no standing army aside from you know the Revolutionary War. But after that, they did not have a standing army. When the revolution was won, they let everything go back to the militia system until the next war, War of 1812. Um, when, um, when the United States was created, there was no, there was no t- income tax. There was not this massive bureaucracy. Now, was there more poverty? Like if you fell into poverty, are you going on food stamps? No. Hopefully your neighbors are kind, right? And in that season, graciously, usually it is the case. Your neighbors were kind. Um, but it's actually an ideal thing because it, it's like the, the system the Lord set up. He says, if you don't work, you don't eat. As a general principle, not as an utter law. If you can't work, if you're disabled, if you are a quadriplegic, the Lord does not expect you to work in order to eat. He doesn't expect the mentally handicapped to the point where they can't do anything. He doesn't expect them to work to eat. He doesn't expect children to necessarily work to eat with exception of maybe chores, right? He he obviously wants them to be diligent people. But he doesn't expect certain classes of disabled and super young people to have to work to eat. But for the average able-bodied adult, in order to eat, you should do some able-bodied work. And that's a good principle. Even the proverb says that uh, laborers... Stomach drives him on with his labor. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. But when when the safety net of our our government is so massive that it consumes the increase of the people, not that I'm necessarily against all safety nets, but when it eats up the totality of the increase of the workers of the people, that is not a good system. And it's a sign of something that has an inevitable end, right? The, the, the safety net grows and blossoms. The government grows and blossoms. The, the, the army becomes larger and more massive. We have something that Eisenhower called 
a military industry. We have an old, whole industry, yet the founders would never have endorsed a continuous, massive standing army, right? In today's system, what you have is you have, I'm not, I'm not trying to portray this as the, the book of Revelations concept of this, but the government is like a beast. And, and many governments are like this. They are just animals that have horrendous appetites and consume everything in sight. And they do not care about the things that are in their way, their prey, right? They're not out there for the, the things that are in front of them. They're there for their own appetite. And unfortunately, that's the system we have today in the United States, at least. Maybe you're fortunate. Maybe you live in a country like Argentina, where you have some level-headed leadership or um, El Salvador or something like that, where you have some level-headed leadership. But in our own country, we have um, a financial sector run by bankers, and the Federal Reserve is run by bankers, and the government is run by private interest, globalists, and different uh, powerful people that do not care about you. They are the people that um, uh, put, work for themselves, their servants. Uh, they, they take, they take, they take, but they do not give except to sort of curry favor and uh, win votes. That's it. They, they don't do it for the genuine benevolence of a ruler wanting the good of his people. And can you just look to the right and the left of what's going on in the United States? Open borders, um, unrest that is stirred up by powerful people in the government, by the media, and all these things. You see, the Lord warned us a long time ago. The Lord, in not so many words, this is not a direct command per se, but why would God have set up the 12 tribes of Israel um, why would he have set up things with a limited government? And why, when the people demanded a strong central government, did he warn them beforehand? The problem wasn't that, you know, Samuel, you know, had bad sons, really. This was their opportunity to get like the nations. And remember who God says runs the nations in some sense in the book of Revelation. It's this Babylonian mysterious crap that uh, darkens the kings of the earth and such things. This system is very gross and dark, and I hope that the Lord, um, as you know, we're heading in a direction as a country in the United States toward, at the very least, we could say it this way, it's unsustainable, the direction we're going, at least with regard to government spending. And... Um, the the amount of our liberties being chastened and in the New York Times they write articles about the Constitution being problematic. Yeah, we're at that stage. We're at that stage where those who have power want to take the last vestiges of semblance of power from the people. And I guess all of this to say the Lord would at least like us to enjoy creaturely freedom. As the prophets say, in the world to come, the intent of God for those who are acceptable to God by justification through faith is for every man to dwell under his own fig tree and under his own vine and to be able to eat there the produce and increase of his hard labor in peace. And that's what a government is supposed to do. A government is not supposed to get in your business when you post on social media, unless you're literally threatening a global leader, which I think they're being very loose with that, if you've seen any of the stories lately, that, that standard of what is a threat. But th the government has one responsibility, to let each man dwell safely under his own fig tree and under his own uh, vine, and to eat the increase of his labor peacefully. We're no longer in a system that promotes that. And the Lord long ago told us that that was not a good way to live. 
Um, I don't know where you stand on the right or the left or what have you, but um, I'm I'm somewhat apolitical in terms of where the lines are usually drawn politically. Um, but I do believe that a limited government is good for people in general. And the limitation on government is for the protection of the people and the longevity of their their government and their system that they dwell in. Um, thanks so much for your time. I don't really have an application. I just wanted to give you a reminder of where the Lord stands on all this, especially as elections are coming up and as you got to make some decisions. Thanks so much. Bye.